Welcome to episode number 243 of Destination Linux. Whether you're brand new to open source or a guru of sudo, this is the podcast for you. My name is Jill, and with me today we have Michael and Ryan. And just off camera, but piped in direct from Jitsi is our glorious community of fact-checking, ego-busting patrons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we love you all. You're in our virtual skybox. <laughs> So on this week's exciting episode of Destination Linux, we have the CEO of Vivaldi joining us to discuss their partnership with Manjaro and their support for Linux. Then we're going to talk about two great anonymous, privacy-focused distros that both had a new release this week. Woo! Plus, we have our tips, tricks, and software picks. All this and more coming up right now on Destination Linux to keep those penguins marching. Hey, Ryan, uh, you, you, that man have noticed that Noah's not with us. Do you have a, an idea of where he might be? Yeah, he did message me right before the show, actually earlier in the week, to tell me that he wasn't going to be here. And it's, uh, I don't know if he wanted me to share this. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, he implemented <laughs> Michael AI into his home assistant and oh. has currently uh -huh. been locked in his garage for the last four days. So, Oh, that makes sense, yeah. As okay. soon as we can figure... I'm trying to do a patch to the code uh, <laughs> that will let him out of his garage, and as soon as I can get that patched, uh, we'll have Noah back next week. All right, perfect. In our community feedback this week, we have a really interesting question from Nice Micro. I submitted this question to our discourse forum. It's talking about Bedrock Linux, and it says, Bedrock Linux doesn't make any sense. It says, recently I saw a few people bringing up Bedrock Linux as the ultimate Linux OS, but reading the specs, it is very dub dubious for me that it makes any practical sense. But before I pass any judgment, I'd like to hear what the community thinks about the meta distribution and what the utility that kind of, like what kind of system it has, what would be the circumstance, and when it is obviously better choice than, say, Arch, for example, with Never. custom. <laughs> of course, you say that for a software that's not in repos and that kind of thing. So, for those who are not familiar with Bedrock Linux, it is a really interesting distribution it because is. it allows you to have mix and match of different components and different packages, even to like low level stuff. It doesn't have to be just applications. It could be all sorts of different stuff you can replace. You can change the core utils. You could change like a different kernel. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. really, really interesting. And it does it by doing this like shamoding system where it has different uh, sections of the system uh, isolated by based on what you use. The thing is, and I wanted to bring this up to the community because, and to the show, because this is such an interesting question because like it's bedrock is very cool, but also it's not for everyone. Yeah, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. You can take packages in this one distro and I could use the Arch AUR here if I wanted to, and then yep. be using dev packages as well and then go use an RPM package from another service, and it's all integrated here. This is kind of a fascinating idea, but when I was looking at it myself, similar um, to, to the nice micro who submitted this question, it made me wonder, is this create a bunch of attack surfaces? Because now I have all of these packages that are being translated on top of these layers. And listen, mm -hmm. That's okay too if it, if it does have those because if it opens those up and this is kind of a niche thing where they're building it for just this specific purpose for people who want to play around and do that stuff, I think it's okay. But if we were going to, let's say, recommend this to a mass community, would this be an unsafe recommendation because it could generate additional tax services? And that's a question I don't know the answer to. Yeah, I think it could be both. Uh, it can go either way depending on uh, what utilities you know, you're using for security, you know, using Debian stable is a good idea. <laughs> for, right. For security, definitely. And uh, Void's run it in its system is, is pretty amazing. You know, the other thing I found interesting is that Bedrock, how you use it is you install a distro, say uh, Debian or Arch, and then you run a script. Mm -hmm. And then you, you customize the script. It's really interesting. <laughs> it is. And also it's worth po pointing out that the the installer for that, that script is an installer that they call the hijack installer. Nice. So, oh, yes. <laughs> so yeah. there you go. That gives you some reference about what it's doing. So you take an existing distribution that you install and you 
you install the extra components and you and it basically manipulates the system from there. Now it doesn't have support for every single distribution, but they do have a compatibility list for different distributions that they work with, as well as uh, other list about like you know things that you should learn, you should know about before you get started and that sort of stuff. But to answer your question, Ryan, I think that yeah, I think it would create more surfaces for attack just because there's more things based on the system. But I I also want to say that. It is a really cool idea, but right. it is not like it's not for everyone. And they say that specifically on their website. It's not for everyone. It is for someone who wants to have basically everything, including the kitchen sink, and be able to <laughs> build out their system how they want it in whatever configuration that they want it. And to like, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, customization in terms of like create uh, changing different things about their system. What if you could change everything? <laughs> and have oh, everything available to you to use it, that's kind of where Bedrock is trying to go. It, it, it's neat. It's a really neat idea. It's almost like if we didn't have flat packs, right? A universal packaging system, how mm. somebody would try to go about solving all of these different packages that yeah. don't come together in the ecosystem. And I think it's fun that people are out there building these kind of Frankenstein projects out there. It reminds me like when I merged xfce and i3wm together where you have xfce panels but you've got i3 in the background doing all your shortcuts and things it, it wasn't meant to be like this thing <laughs> where i'm going to take over the desktop <laughs> environment world it was yeah. a frankenstein project for fun and in some ways wasn't a great idea because you're utilizing you're you're removing the one benefit of i3wm which is all the low resources by adding all these panels and everything else on top of it but again it was meant to be fun and I think that's kind of what's neat about this bedrock and the unique file system that they have. Mm -hmm. um, cubes, mm -hmm. though, when I think about a project mm -hmm. where you want to run a bunch of different distros securely, cubes is the one that kind of comes to my mind here as if you wanted something kind of like this, but you really wanted to run it as your like daily, isolation. having that isolation through cubes seems like the right place you would want to go. Yeah, cubes is really cool. I I think I think cubes is an interesting thing. It it's also one of those things that it's not for everyone. I mean, cubes is 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 different in like the way that this does it. It has a, it does a you know it kind of isolates stuff and it's sort of containerized, but not really. I would say that Bedrock's file system structure is is as you said, it's a unique file system, but it also means that it's going to be doing things vastly different from everything else. So if you wanted to use it, keep in mind it would be. You'll be learn. You'll be spending a lot of time in the documentation to learn how this thing works. Uh, and the same kind of thing goes with Cubes because Cubes is a distribution that does uh, everything in more of a virtual machine approach. And this, the the biggest drawback to Cubes is really the massive amount of resources that you would need because I think the the like mm -hmm. the bare minimum it suggestion does, yeah. was like eight gigs of RAM or something like that. Yeah, it, it requires a lot of resources. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, I couldn't get it to install on a lot of my newer <laughs> machines, so I don't think it has a lot of hardware yeah. enablement by default either. But it is cool. I love it cubes. Cool. I think it's awesome. I also really appreciate the community bringing up Bedrock Linux because I wasn't familiar with it. I'd heard about it, but I'd never researched it. And I think it's cool. It's a cool Frankenstein-like project, yep. and I don't mean that in a negative way. I think it's cool to take things and try to converge them and see what you can build yeah. And so if people want to check it out, check out Bedrock Linux. Absolutely. And Frankenstein in the sense of like, it's just a cool thing that you can build it because it does have a weird of a, con a negative connotation. I love connotation. horror movies. So to yeah. me, it's yeah. a positive does, connotation, does, but so. some people probably look at right. that as negative and I don't but, mean it in that way. <laughs> but yeah, there are a Bedrock. lot of cool uh, distros that are yeah. doing interesting stuff like this. Yeah. yeah. The Bedrock is bare metal Frankenstein. <laughs> there you go. Bare metal Frankenstein. <laughs> nice. A cooler version of Frankenstein. Yeah. <laughs> we love hearing from our worldwide community. What we want you to do is get your official DLN mug like this one, fill it with some coffee or bubbly, sit down on the nearest stool, and send us an email to comments at destinationlinux.org. And if you would like to join our wonderful discourse uh, community discussions, then join the DLN community forum by going to dlnforum.com. This episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean. I love DigitalOcean so much. 
Michael, I'm, I, I keep asking you every week, can I build this new project? And a lot of times you say no, but sometimes you let me <laughs> go and build those new projects. And you think you're like, my gosh, Ryan is brilliant. He set up the server and got it running in seconds. But what I didn't tell you, Michael, is that I cheat because DigitalOcean has these one-click installs. You just kind of <laughs> click it and boom, it's done for you, all the work. And you just log in through an SSH key and you're good. And that's what I love about DigitalOcean. But they have another service that they recently announced. It's their managed MongoDB service, which is a fully managed database as a service. With managed MongoDB, you can focus more on building the scalable high-performance apps and less on maintaining the database, which nobody wants to do that part. Like, I like building the servers, Michael, but I don't want to maintain them. I want other people. That's why we got Ninja from the community to maintain them and Brandon and Eric, because I don't want to do that part. And that's what I love about DigitalOcean is they're going to, in this service, take that over for you. DigitalOcean built this service in partnership with MongoDB Incorporated, and together they've ensured that you'll get access to the latest releases of MongoDB document database as they become available. As a listener of Destination Linux Podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. Actually, better than free. They're going to hand you $100 in free credit that you can build and do these one-click drops and make all your friends, like I tricked Michael, think you're really smart too, when in reality, the person's really smart, it's DigitalOcean, because they built this amazing platform that's one-click. So we want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Destination Linux and encourage all of you to go right now to do.co slash dln dash mongo and get that free $100 credit. Again, that's do.co slash dln dash mongo. We have a very special guest that we'd like to welcome to the show, and that is Jan von Tetschner. Jan is the co-founder and CEO of Vivaldi Technologies, the company behind the Vivaldi browser. Jan, welcome to the show. Thank you. This week, Manjaro and Vivaldi released news that there's a new default browser for Manjaro Cinnamon Edition. will change It changed from Firefox to Vivaldi. So we wanted to have Jan on the show to discuss this partnership. But before we get into all of that sort of stuff, we want to know a little bit more about you, Jan. Uh, so Jan, as the co-founder and CEO of uh, Vivaldi, tell us how it came about. How did Vivaldi Technologies come into existence and what is your vision for the company? People, Some people may know that I've been doing browsers as far back as 1994 um, when I co-founded kind of Opera. Um, right. And now... I've co-founded Vivaldi, and I guess the principle of what we are doing is the same. We we just think that users should be listened to. We should adapt to the needs of of, of users. Uh, we shouldn't be use telemetry. We shouldn't use profiling. We should just be listening what people have to say. And we we think people have different opinions and have different ways of using browsers. And we think it's really really important to have a browser that. Uh, things like that that uh, actually uh, acts on what individual users want and not just uh, masses right absolutely so so that's kind of where we what we are about and what we believe is the right way to do software so at the founding of Vivaldi though this was a this could be a big deal and I kind of wanted to get more into this story here because you started with Opera you helped found that very well known browser and then at some point you decided, hey, we're going to go a different direction. And you took the bold move to say, I'm going to go and start this Vivaldi Technologies and build this other browser. Can you take us into that? What what transpired there and what made you think there needs to be another browser? Yeah, I think... Um I, I, I think there's a, there's a little bit of a story here. For me, obviously, I mean, I've been doing, like I said, I've been doing browsers for a really long time. And I mean, I was the co-founder of Opera. I was the CEO of Opera. I ran the company for more than 15 years. And then I quit. And, and I mean, it was a, a disagreement about the direction of the company with investors and, and the like. I mean, it's the kind of thing that you can run into. Then I, my thinking was after I quit that I would actually just continue to use Opera. I wasn't expecting the changes to be as big as they ended up being. Mm -hmm. Now Opera ended up going in a very different direction. And I had all those users that had shown so much loyalty and, and support. I mean, over all those years. And I felt I, I couldn't let them hang, hang there and, and be unhappy with the browser that we all kind of created together. And so my thinking was, okay. 
uh, opera is going in a different direction. I need to do the right thing. And, and I couldn't do anything about what Opera was doing, but I could start another browsing company. So it's really about the users that have been supporting us for all those years. And we have kind of started with a slogan, a browser for our friends, right? So yeah. it, it, it's, it's kind of that's where it's coming from. I mean, l- looking at what those people and what new people that want to use our browser, what they want and listening to their needs and, and the like. I mean, I can tell you it wasn't fun what happened at Opera, uh, seeing your creation over many years kind of being destroyed, uh, which is, by the way, why we as a company, as Vivaldi, we don't have any external investors. It's only uh, employees that own shares. And we want to keep it that way because we want to stay on the straight and narrow. We've seen what can happen when the wrong people get in charge. And we don't want to see that happen with, with all our hard work again. I found that fascinating. It's why I wanted to dig in a little more as I was reading the story. And I also, of course, about the employees having shares in the company. And that was so important to you as someone who's been in corporate America for 22 years and watching people take that bold move at times to say, you know what, this isn't what I want to be a part of. I'm going to step away. I'm going to go do this other thing. I always wonder that moment when you said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to stop doing this and I'm going to break off and I'm going to do my own thing. That had to yeah. be scary for you. That had to be, mm-hmm. I mean, that takes courage. We only have a few moments of, I feel like in life where we have the opportunity to do something like that. What was that like for you? Well, in, in some ways, this, in my case, came in two steps. The first step was basically saying, okay, I'm going to leave my company in the hands of others. Uh, they couldn't continue the fight. Uh, it was just too much. Right. So I decided, okay, I'm going to leave the company and I'm going to hope they do the right thing. And I was kind of expecting uh, them to do more of the right thing than the wrong things. And, and then I saw, okay, that's really not happening. And I hadn't really planned to start another browsing company because I was thinking my old browser was going to be around and I could continue to use it. Right. Maybe it would change a little bit, but I wasn't expecting the, the philosophy to change and, and the like. I guess in many ways, I mean, for me, when I started Opera, that was also a big decision. Uh, to to basically leave work and yeah. start a, a browsing company with seven thousand uh, dollars, which, by the wow. way, lasted for five years. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm 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 used to doing things in a different way. And and, and this second time, amazing. we we did have a little bit more funding because I ended up selling my shares in Opera, and that allowed me to actually fund Vivaldi, and that's how we fund the company. The, the funding is basically out of my pocket. Uh, and, and, and then I wanted all the employees to be part of this and all, all of them to be owners. And, and it's not about, okay, we have a plan to go public or get all their investors in the future. Actually, the opposite of that. We want to just keep the company as is. We don't want to go public. We don't want investors. We want to build a really good company that builds great software that people enjoy. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, John. And, you know, I really feel that you've brought the, the best things from Opera over to Vivaldi. Absolutely. And, and Opera, uh, if a lot of people don't know, it was dominant on mobile for many, many years. That was, you know, our go-to browser on mobile. I used to and, uh, Opera Mini on my yeah. feature phone. Yeah. I oh, yeah. That. All yes, of us had exactly. it, of course. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so that was really, really wonderful. And... John, you know, many people praise Vivaldi for the fact that it treats Linux as a first-class citizen, meaning when you release new features, Linux users get those features at the same time as everyone else. Yay! So tell us about your feelings on Linux and why this first-class relationship was important to you. I think, I mean, Linux has always been very important. And and I think what we see is, I mean, personally, for me, in, in many ways, I started on Unix, right? Yes. <laughs> Nice. Uh, all the way back to, to SonOS and the like, where we were doing kind of work in the old days. And I mean, the initial work actually on Opera started on SonOS as well. 
Linux is, is, is kind of is special to me. Uh, and, 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 and I think also it's an important operating system for the future. I'm, I'm seeing what Microsoft is doing with Windows. I don't like the direction. I think Linux is more about kind of allowing people to get it their way. The fact that you have all the different editions and, and uh, all the different variants of, of Linux, I think is brilliant. And I think the, the flexibility that you offer, I mean, that's what I believe in, that I believe in that there isn't a one size fits all for software. I think it needs to be adapted to the requirements of every individual. And you do that by providing a lot of options, right? Yeah. And you have that kind of flexibility. You don't, I mean, you, you, when you're using Mac OS, people love it. A lot of people love it, but, but it is kind of one size fits all. And the sure. same it, it, it is with, with Windows as well. I mean, and Microsoft is gradually kind of limiting your options. I mean, for me, the idea that you have to log into something online to log into your computer is crazy. Mm -hmm. So exactly. it, 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 just <laughs> that would be enough to, to, to want something else. And, and I think, I mean, for, for me, Linux is something different there. And I mean, I feel at home in, in, in the terminal. I, I feel at home with the systems as they are. And, yeah. and that, that's what I like to use. So let me, let me dig deeper there for a second. A lot of products that come out, open source software and things that come into Linux, even if they got their start, they got their popularity in Linux. We find, for instance, Mozilla Firefox will release a VPN service but Linux users don't get it for months later. Vivaldi decided at some point, it seems like very early on that, hey, when we release new features, we're going to treat Linux like a first-class citizen, and they're going to get those features the same time as everyone else. There had to be a philosophical decision that you and the team made to do that, and I'm, I'm interested in how that came about. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, uh, we just think Linux is extremely important. And by the way, if you look at our user base, you'll find that uh, Linux is, uh, as a percentage of market share, it's our most important operating system from that perspective. Awesome. I mean, I'm not saying that it's more users than Windows, but what I'm saying as a percentage of the operating system, it is important. And we see the potential to obviously have a significant position on Linux, right? It is, uh, so for us, it is a natural, I think a lot of us that work at Vivaldi, we use Linux, uh, we prefer Linux, and, and so for, so this, this, this is natural. We also have a number of people using Macs and they're like, philosophically, I mean, we did this at Opera as well. We, we went through the motion of doing native kind of, programming and the like uh, for every platform and 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 we ended up, I remember we had a year at the most between one release on a platform until we got it on the next one and that doesn't work so we have a lot of experience in the Vivaldi team with those kind of things and we looked at a way how can we do this cross platform how can we make it work from day one that was that was crucial to us, and 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 that's what we've done. And so there's a number of reasons. There's practicality. It's how do we do software the best possible ways, and and the fact that we think Linux is extremely important. That is awesome. And what's what's also interesting to me is that the the values that you had with Opera brought into Vivaldi, and you basically improved what I already thought was a good browser. So like making like there are so many things that you keep coming out with of customizations and controls and stuff that, that Vivaldi has that is just fantastic. But the, the one of the things that is most interesting to me is the fact that you have such a clear focus on privacy and and security and making sure that things like that are are a big focus and since it's if you since Vivaldi has very strong stances when it comes to user privacy it kind of made me curious as a free service how does Vivaldi fund its operations because a lot of these companies are using the telemetry and stuff like that to sell the data to be able to fund it so how does Vivaldi do it I mean basically it, it's we have uh, we do deals with search providers right so we integrate search uh, and that generates a significant part of our revenues, and then we do bookmarks. We don't need to be connect, collecting any data. Uh, we don't think we should be collecting any data. We just think it's wrong. We think no company should be collecting data to be totally frank. agree. <laughs> uh, uh, so that's that's not where we where we're coming from. It's, it's it's a method that has been used for years to work with the search providers, and and you get a little bit of revenue from that. Now we mm -hmm. may not be making a lot of revenue per users, but we don't need to do that. We we just need enough to pay the bills. 
So okay. this is so people understand what that means when you're making deals with search providers, but you're not turning over user information. What you're saying is the defaults options for search providers or some of the icons that you may get by default on your start page will have certain Amazon or some other companies there to as a highlight of a place that you could go, a URL where you could go. Yep. But in that, there's no displaying anybody's data. You're not sending their data to those search providers. You're not sending their data to the Amazon icon or Facebook icon that you have. They're just URLs, fast, quick links for when you install Vivaldi, correct? Yeah, it's, it's basically links, yeah. And the same with the search is basically going to the search. So we don't collect data on users. We don't do it on our servers and we don't do it locally. We are not collecting information. And, and, and by the way, I think this is really important because some people seem to think that it's better to collect data locally than in the cloud. To me, that's fundamentally wrong. You can utilize, uh, where, I mean, technically speaking, it's just a distribution of how you deal with the data. You can utilize local data to create a, a, a profile on a user, which you can then use exactly. to select ads, which are kind of detrimental to that user or you can then send that data to a site that you visit and the like so so for me you shouldn't collect data not in the cloud and not on the user on the machine and and so we don't do that i mean obviously that being said i mean obviously you have browser history and the like but we don't have access to that right that's yep. none of our business very nice so you're on a very important topic that i know our community is going to want to focus on more which is privacy and security. Specifically, last week, we talked about the recent surveillance bill that was launched in Australia. It's really got a lot of people worried because what happens and gets accepted in one area, even if you're not in Australia, and we have lots of listeners in Australia that we're concerned about, it's one of those things where it could easily spread. What is your personal opinion on the state of privacy and security on the internet as it is today? No, I mean, I want to swear, but... Uh, I Thank mean, you. <laughs> yes, me too. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's pretty bad. And, and, and I think in a way, I mean, there is focus on governments and what governments might do. But I think, uh, like the, the Norwegian spy chief said, you should be worried about what the private companies are doing. And I think the real, I mean, uh, the biggest issue is companies like Google and Facebook collecting our data, making profiles on this, which they then make available through various means. And I think that's really, really, really bad. And I mean, this is something we take really seriously. I've obviously talked about this a number of times with, with a lot of people, with media, with politicians. There was a, a, a nice little document that I think everyone should read by the Norwegian Consumer Council basically analyzing kind of surveillance-based advertisement and why it should be banned. We quickly came out in support of that with a number of other companies. We, we, we didn't have a lot of time and we wanted to get a letter to the EU. So we collected a, a few companies uh, that are in our business and, and we sent in a letter. We think this is really important. We think this is something that's worth fighting for. For me, I've been fighting to get people on the internet. Uh, so equal access to information and services has been extremely important. This is why we invented services like Opera Mini, which for a lot of countries became the one primary way of accessing the internet. If you had a really bad network, the capability to, to kind of run uh, internet on a pretty bad mobile phone, potentially, and, and get access to a lot of information that way was important. So when someone takes our efforts at getting people access to the internet and makes it into a machine for programming us, there's something seriously wrong. And, and, and that's what this is. I mean, call it what it is. It is a programming API to program us and give us opinions or get us to buy things. And I mean, the fact that basically anything we do online is being tracked by a, a, a number of big companies. And I think it's, this is important. It's, it's a few big companies. There's others that are following in their footsteps, but really it's, 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 a, it's a few companies that have been given the leeway to do a lot of damage. And they're collecting information online, combining that with information they get from other sources like Bluetooth beacons, uh, credit card information. It's endless. And, 
It's endless. Yeah. And, and, and it's just wrong. I mean, you wouldn't accept your postman reading your mail or your telco listening to your calls or your if a painter comes in and does some work at your house, you wouldn't expect them to make a kind of a, a list of your furniture and whatever you <laughs> might say while you were there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I like that example. How ridiculous! But yet, this is what we're allowing in a way. Yes. We're, we're allowing this, and and, uh, and I think it's it's which is why I think we can get uh, our politicians want to do the right things, but they need our help basically to make the right choices because these guys are spending a lot of money to try to influence them into. Something like, oh, they'll say, oh, if we stop doing surveillance-based ads, it's going to be so hard for small businesses, stuff like that. And yeah. and I think the reality is, I've been on the internet from the beginning, and we did quite fine without surveillance-based ads. It's only in yeah. the last 10 years that's been doing. I love when these companies say that, by the way. They're like, well, well, you're you're hurting us. How are we going to make money? I'm like, wait a minute. Are we saying that ads only came about like, <laughs> during the last five years? Somehow marketing and advertising was able to target audiences without stealing all their personal data for decades. But now we have to, to survive, be able to know every infinitesimal <laughs> detail about the person who's using a browser or whatnot. I think it's very interesting what you're saying because Vivaldi has positioned itself with these issues from a structural standpoint by not having outside investors and where you can not only say, yes, we're behind privacy and security, which you see every company practically saying that statement, but because you don't have those outside investors telling you, Hey, uh, don't go against Facebook here. or Don't go against this person here. They're our partner. Uh, you can actually go and sign those bills and get involved in the politics without fear of retribution or losing your funding and things. And I think that makes Vivaldi in a very unique position that a lot of companies don't put themselves in. Yeah. And John, speaking of which, have you guys thought about doing your own search engine? I'm loving what I'm hearing here about, you know, privacy because Vivaldi, you know, as soon as you open it, it asks you, you know, what level of privacy you want in your browser. And I think you guys doing a search engine... <laughs> would be really awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's always tempting, but we can't do everything. So I, I, yeah. I think there's some there's some really good <laughs> privacy-oriented uh, search engines out there. There's DuckDuckGo, there's StartPage, and there's Very actually a, a, a more <laughs> happening. And I think, I mean, supporting these guys, that, that's the important thing for me. So, cool. so we, we, we'll do our side. We'll do our stuff and then we'll leave that to those guys to do, to do the search engines. And I think it, it requires uh, more than a single company to solve all the all the problems mm -hmm. we have to deal with. Fair. Yeah. So th there's a lot of things that I like about Vivaldi, but one of the things that I was curious about is because there, oh, there's so many features and all the cool things that you keep coming out with. But when you compare Vivaldi to other browsers in the market, what do you think what, what do you think makes Vivaldi stand out from all of the rest of them? I mean, I think there's a number of things. And I think we have to, obviously, people want need to be able to look at us and say, okay, what they're doing is the right thing. But I think even if they liked what they were doing, they also have to like the product that we built, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. And, and I think our philosophy, so instead of telemetry, instead of collecting points about how people are using the browser, we have this unique idea of actually just listening. Uh, what? And, and I don't understand that, for... that statement. <laughs> yeah, don't don't do that as a company. That's a horrible idea. No. Yeah, it, it 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 kind of. I mean, it's it's not really rocket science. It's basically people have opinions, and we think we value individuals, not just groups of people. So from that perspective, if someone is asking for a feature or asking for a different way to do things, we think we should provide ways to do that. Now, obviously, we can't out of the box with the defaults have everything perfect for everyone, but there should be ways to customize, to get it to work exactly the way you want it. You want your tabs on the left side or right side or bottom instead of the top? That's okay. Now, you want tab stacks? Okay. I yes. mean, tab stacks, but... Not one way of doing tab stacks, that's mm -hmm. too few. Three different ways of doing tab stacks. Yeah. I mean, it's like because it. people have different ways. And obviously, then presented in different ways on the top, left, right, and the like, optimized for people. Mm -hmm. uh, keyboard shortcuts. I mean, some people mm -hmm. never use them. I love them. 
so single key port shortcuts, being able to adapt them to, and change them uh, individually. Menus. Now, some people think you shouldn't have menus. They're old-fashioned, but a lot of people like menus and love menus. Sure. And a lot of people have really strong opinions on how their menu should be structured. So what do we do? We make you available to edit the menus to your liking, exactly how you like them. Then we do things like um, quick commands, right? So you like to, to enter commands. Now we are adding the capability to link them together so you can have chain commands. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, we take this kind of further and further from the perspective of what do you want to see as a user. I think you'll find that some people, they look at something we've added and they think, oh, this is stupid. And they will think, why don't they spend more time on my feature? <laughs> uh, that happens. <laughs> oh, so you did get my emails. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we, we, I mean, we, we, we get this all the time. And what we're trying to do is that we're trying to build something that everyone can individualize. And, and there yes. will be things that you like. There will be things that you don't like. If you don't like it, don't use it, hide it, get rid of it. We, we'll provide that way as well. And I mean, as part of this, I mean, we're going all the way, like building a mail client, building a calendar. Part of this is thinking, we think it's a problem that you have different mail services that you have to log in. You're kind of gradually taking away the beauty of mail, which is that it's a client server structure. You can choose a different client. You can have multiple servers and it works, right? Yeah. So we're providing a client that helps you organize your mail. It's, uh, we have a database underneath. It helps you to find any content in any mail very quickly. It's easy to work with at the same time, kind of structurally sound and, and, and the like. We're building a calendar. I wanted a calendar that's not, I don't like online calendars. I like mm -hmm. to have my calendars locally. So we have a calendar you can use locally or online or a combination of the both because we all have different ways of thinking. Nice. You can click inside it and you can type. That's one of the things that I thought was important, that you could just click and type and there would be no pop-up. Now, we have the pop-up because not everyone agrees with me. <laughs> uh, so we have different ways, right? I mean, that's, that's how we do. We have yeah. this principle, when in doubt, make it an option, right? Love it. That's so, kind of like KDE, Michael, I feel is. like. There's like ton, yeah. The other browsers are kind of GNOME, where we give you no option, we decide what's best for you, and... Of all these kind of like the KDE, uh, we're going to give you the option and you can yep. decide if you want to use There's it or not. a lot of cool things. Yeah. Like uh, when yeah. you announced that you were making the mail client in there and the calendar. And I knew that at one point back in the day, Opera had some of those features as well. And I was wondering, like, is it has it improved in the style of how you do it and how the workflow is? And it is a lot, lot easier to use in Vivaldi. And the, the part you mentioned, mm -hmm. the just typing into the box and not having to do a pop-up to click all of these different things just to add a, one thing to a particular day is, it was something that was kind of like, I never thought I wanted it, but when I used it, it was, oh, yeah, this is a lot easier to do. Why do I have to do a pop-up and then choose all the different times and whatever and the re reminders and whatnot when I could just, I want it on this one day and I'll come back later and make adjustments if I need to. But you were talking about uh, uh, all the great features that you ha that Vivaldi has. And there is one feature it doesn't have that I kind of wish it did because it is my favorite feature of another browser, uh, Firefox. And it's, it's actually a, a separate add-on uh, extension. And so it's not a default feature. But I was wondering if there's a possibility of considering multi-account containers or container tabs because it is mm -hmm. of such a nice feature to be able to not have to log in and out of the different tabs. Now, I love the fact that the, the tabs are, you know, there's so many different controls that you have in the tabs, like the tab stacking. And I was wondering if there's a way to kind of mesh in a ability to separate the sessions and the cookies, because then that would make Vivaldi like a very hard browser to not use. Yeah. I mean, generally, as you, as you know, we want to make our users happy. So whenever there's a feature like this uh, that people want to see, and, and you're not the only one asking for it, we want to find a solution. Now, this one is a little bit tricky. It requires changing in the Chromium code base and, and, and the like. So we uh, will find a way, but I can't promise how quickly. So it, it, it's, it's basically, do we want to add this kind of feature? Yes, uh, we just have to find a way to do it. And sometimes that takes a little bit longer. But, uh, I mean, 
the, when you're there's gonna have to there's... put up with Michael's emails until then, but uh, <laughs> Sorry at least that. you'll have that constant <laughs> reminder. You know, yeah, I it, love it, that you're all good. working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, John, and I love one of my favorite features is the tab tiling. In fact, I'm using it right now. <laughs> yep. And and I'm using uh, Vivaldi Notes. I've been using that feature since you know you started it. <laughs> so. Good to hear. I mean, we, we're trying to basically look at ways to to kind of uh, take it to the next level, not be limited to what uh, others are doing and. And we are continuing to look at ways to improve that. So, like you said, you have the notes function. It's it's very popular among our users. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ability to tile tabs is, is really useful for people. Whether you, you're just doing kind of, I mean, you can do stacking. You can then do tiling. And, and, and the ability, especially if you have a big screen, being able to utilize that screen better. You're not going to be reading, if you have a 20, 30, 40 inch screen, you're not going to be reading lines that go across it. So finding a better way to make use of that is, is clearly a benefit. And, and obviously, if you then have multiple stacks that are tiled, you can go between different setups of the browser really easily. That, that's, there's mm-hmm. details like this which uh, help you be more efficient. And, and that's kind of what we are trying to do. Awesome. John, this week, Manjaro and Vivaldi announced that Manjaro Cinnamon will now use the Vivaldi browser by default. So how did this uh, partnership with Manjaro come about? I mean, we've been talking for a long time. And I think we quickly found that there is a... Uh, I mean, the joint spirits. I mean, I, I think we, we, we see uh, the kind of problems we'd like to solve together. We see that we have a good fit there. I, I think it's basically, it's, it's mutual respect. Uh, we like what they're doing. They like what we are doing. And so that's where all of this comes from. Uh, we, we have enjoyed our collaboration immensely. We're very proud that they made this uh, bold uh, decision to to select us. We we know that there are some people that don't like that we are being selected. That's kind of, uh, I think, some people think that there should only be one browser on Linux. But they made this choice, and I think it is good to to make it visible to people that there are good choices out there. And and what we are going to try to do as well as we can is to to provide the best browser possible for Mandiaro. Uh, we are working closely with the team. We're getting feedback from them, what they need, what they want to see in the browser, the directions. They're asking a lot of questions about things like mail, which we like. Uh, there's a, There's a good relationship between us and and long may that continue. So we're obviously huge fans of the Manjaro project. We had Philip on just a few episodes back. You kind of touched already on what it's like um, or some of the discussions that you're having with the Manjaro team. But when you compare working with, say, the Manjaro team to other folks, uh, leads of projects that you've worked on, kind of give us the inside scoop. What's Philip really like to work with? Behind closed some, doors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, behind closed Aww. doors. I think the feeling is basically, this is great. They they respect what we are doing. We respect what they are doing. They like what we are doing. There's a lot of just mutual respect. And that's 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 the beauty of it. I like that. Uh, it's, it's all solution-oriented. How do we make things work? And, and yeah. that's what we're working for. Basically, building the best possible solutions and, and, and the like. And, and, and that's really what this is all about. I have a couple questions that came in from the community that I thought were interesting and wanted to ask. How did the name Vivaldi come about? <laughs> I, I, I think in some ways, to be frank, you, you look at the name Opera. Um, we came up with a name called Opera the first time. The second time we Makes came sense. up with Vivaldi. Yes. Uh, yeah. I was actually using it for other purposes. Uh, and then we just think, hmm, it's actually not being widely used. Is it possible that we could be so lucky the second time to actually have a name that you don't need to kind of memorize to be able to spell it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and also, the, the, do we like music? Yes, we do like music. Uh, the, the, I mean, my great grandfather actually was a composer. Mm. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of respect uh, there as well. Beautiful Very music. Nice. And I hope you can live up to that with the browser as well. Nice. Yeah. And and then some people are asking about Vivaldi in the initial installation, you're assigned a unique ID and it sends a message to a server every 24 hours that ID, version, CPU architecture, and screen resolution. Some people are worried about this. 
talk to us about that. Is that something to be fearful of? Why every 24 hours? Why not longer periods in between? I, I actually, I mean, and, and we understand. Uh, and, and this is, I mean, the, the fact is people know what we are doing, right? So, they, I mean, we have users that uh, trust and verify, which I think is a really good thing. So they're looking at what we are doing. Basically, we want to know how many users we have. We want to know kind of what operating system and the like. Uh, we have been trying to work on a solution that we don't need a unique ID because we understand that people are concerned about that. But in reality, this is... We're not tracking our users. We're not utilizing this to try to find anything. We're basically using it for counting. That's right. it. Right. And that's how you know, for instance, Linux is a very popular option for Vivoli. You kind of have yes. an idea of the architecture they're using um, so that you know what new features to build and those things. And this is a common issue that happens in open source because everybody, a lot of people in the open source community are very privacy and security conscious, much like you are. This is a passion for us. And so anytime there's any metrics gathered now, we're, we're afraid. We get afraid. Um, and this is a problem, Michael, you've talked about with many Ubuntu times. and others mm -hmm. who are trying to get mm -hmm. the same information. They make a distro. They want to know how many people use it, just some basic information that they're going to use internally so that they can understand what things that they're going to be building. For instance, do they really need to focus on 4K? Maybe only 1% of their population have 4K monitors. Those are interesting things, and it's unfortunate that – the way things have gone with marketing that even innocent grabs of information or, or looking for just basic things to help users are now frowned upon or looked down upon because we know so many companies historically have abused that privilege. Absolutely. Right? They say one thing and do something Absolutely. else. That's a fantastic thing to say because there's actually something that I have always touted about like telemetry is not necessarily a bad thing. Just because mm -hmm. most companies that you've heard about it from, like the big corporations are abusing telemetry, it doesn't mean telemetry is bad. It just means that the way they are doing it is bad. And I think that the getting information about the ID and the system and how many people are using the browser is great. And it's something that Linux has, I think, made a wrong move by not doing it in the first place. Because we have this ecosystem of, you know, we don't know how many people are using Linux. Like in the grand scheme of it, regardless of what distro it is, you really, really don't know. Like most of the time, we don't even know how many people are using a, sp a particular distro. So there's no way for us to say like when you go to a company, like I've talked to many different companies. I've tried to get to make their software for Linux. And they always say something like, well, how many users are there? Or there's not enough users or something mm -hmm. like that. And there's no way for me to show any data about that because we don't, as a, as a community, we don't trust the idea of just a basic ID or a basic count. And I think that that is a mistake because we need to be able to tell them, this is how many people will see your stuff. And there's so much more value in it. And I think that, and, and it's also not a big issue because it's not private data. It's not personal information or anything. It's just a basic number structure to be able to like, maybe like the CPU architecture, whether it's using an uh, x86 or an ARM or something like that, that is also a useful thing because you can use that to expand the ecosystem. I think it's a mistake that the community is anti Well, that's that. what we talked about before that we think there needs to be like an EFF like coalition for right. ethical telemetry, ethical ads that really sets the standards for say an open source community or as privacy advocates that states these are the acceptable ways and how you can go about them in an open source manner to to be able to get this information without violating potentially violating people's rights and things but that's a business idea i'm going to throw to you later i just need a billion dollars of funding but we'll talk after the show <laughs> no, <I'm teasing. laughs> sure so john uh what are you, you've touched on some of the customizations you're doing for monjero like one of my favorite things is the theming integration and, you know, the, the whole concept of customization fits so beautifully with Manjaro and Linux in general, being able mm -hmm. to customize completely your browser experience with your desktop experience. Are there actually plans to expand this outside of the Cinnamon desktop into other desktop interfaces like XFCE or GNOME? I mean, uh, th th that's uh, definitely uh, our hope. Yes, uh, and I think there is uh, there is interest in doing that. I think uh, basically this is this is the first edition. 
I, yes. I think uh, <laughs> we, we, we are very proud to be there. And obviously, the goal is to expand on this. I think there's a lot of ways we can work together uh, with regards to customization. Obviously, just out of the box, Vivaldi is extremely customizable. Mm -hmm. And we are working with them to allow them to do changes uh, and, and adapt. And then we are looking at basically them telling us what would they like to see in the browser. There are another voice coming in there and saying, this is what we'd like you to do. And they've shown a lot of interest in things like the mail and the calendar and a number of other things. They've asked us questions. Do we have plans to add certain features in the future? We've told them yes. And and obviously, if they ask for something else, then we'd like to do that. I mean, I, I think they're concerned about the needs of their users. Uh, we are mm -hmm. concerned about the needs of their users. They are our users. They're the kind of people we'd like to win. And, and, and we will do whatever we can to, to kind of make the most flexible browser and, and, and work closely with them. And I think, uh, we hope to earn more, more additions in the future. We, we know it kind of, this is about the feedback we're getting from users and the like. And so far, it's been really good. Awesome. Nice. Uh, there, there is something that I want to talk about, but it's going to be a little bit of like a borderline question because there's a, you know, there's a lot of people in the community that don't like Chromium. And because of because of Google's dominance in the browser market, you know, so as an example, Google recently cut off uh, access to several of their APIs, including the sync after like seven years or so for some browsers. Uh, what are your thoughts on the dominance of the Google base and how this might impact the market in a long term stance? I think obviously, I, I think it's good to have multiple code bases. Uh, one of the reasons why I started Vivaldi was actually Opera killed our old code base, which was Presto, uh, which I think was a terrible decision, uh, oh, yeah. by the way. I think it, it, it was a really good code base, um, but the investors didn't see the value of having their own code base. And I think those mm -hmm. are the kind of decisions that have been made by a number of different companies. There's not a lot of code bases left, and I'm fearing that there's going to be even less in the future. So I would like to see choices. Obviously, you have to remember things like sync. I mean, we are doing ourselves. We try to rely as little on Google services as possible. So we do our own sync and we'll continue to do our own things as much as, as possible. But is it better that we have more choices? Of course it is. I'm, 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 I'm all for open standards. But the reality, it's, it's, it's looking kind of bleak on, on that front right now. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure we are going to be having, I mean, we don't really have that many browser engines left, but I think we can try to work on other things. I think there are other things that lock you into Google. And I think we are providing ways for people to get away from the Google ecosystem. Part of that is things like the mail clients and the calendar and, and, and the like, which is making it easier to move away from Google services. And I think that's important. Do you think a lot of people don't understand the fact that Chromium is open source in itself? And does that create some misconceptions? Potentially, uh, but I, I mean, I can understand why people are concerned about big companies having a strong position, but you're right. Chromium is not only used by Google and Vivaldi and Opera and Microsoft. And uh, I mean, the fact that Microsoft caved in, uh, to, to me, that was huge, mm -hmm. right? And, and mm -hmm. yes, now there are multiple companies. And I think there's a significant benefit that there are mul multiple strong, big companies that are actually... Uh, working on the same code base. I think that's good and that gives us hope that that code base can function as an open source. That's, that's interesting because, I mean, the, the fact that there's many companies working on it is uh, very good in terms of having it be able to, you know, benefit from that sense. But how will companies like Vivaldi compete in a browser market with the control and largely just, you know, influenced by a single company like Google, because a lot, a lot of people aren't aware that Google does still control the Chromium based browser or the, the engine itself and the, the framework. So how would, how would Vivaldi compete in that with that such heavy influence from one company? Well, basically it's about the features, right? I mean, we just, yes, we use the same code base, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of differences in the feature set that you find in Vivaldi compared to other browsers. 
I mean, most of the Chromium-based browsers do not have a tracker blocker and ad blocker built in. Most of them do not have a mail plant and calendar. Mm -hmm. More or less, none mm -hmm. of them have web panels, uh, note, notes, uh, the ability to take snapshots of, of pages. I mean, there's just a lot of features that you don't find anywhere else. So, yes, the underlying code for viewing the web pages is similar, but... There's a lot of uh, differences, and, and and I mean that includes the the connections to Google. I think you'll find that we have less connections to Google than more or less anyone, because we we go out of our way to do things ourselves, uh, which includes, for example, the sync function and the like. So for us, the fact that they would stop supporting sync in all the browsers didn't didn't matter to us. Oh, and speaking of that, John, you know, getting away from the reliance of, of Google, uh, that's one of the reasons I love Vivaldi so much, because I can use it for mail, I can use it for my notes and not rely on on Google's notes. Are there other fee services that Vivaldi is looking to expand into in the future? I think a big part of our focus is what we do on the client side. Now we do have mm. like we do have free web mail, we do have a free calendar and and we have all the free services like blogs and the like and this yeah. is a way for us to give back to our community uh, basically none of those services have ads, none of them are anything else but just free services for our users. We will probably expand a bit on that in the future. We have some ideas on what to do there to based on the feedback we have from users, but mostly what we are doing is i mean. Uh, doing things on the client side, right? Providing, uh, the, the expanding on the mail client, adding more features there, uh, on the calendar, the feeds. Again, the, the concept of the feeds is to get you away from the learning mechanism that knows what you read. When you have a feed reader, you get news not based on what you read, but what you subscribe to. It mm -hmm. may sound similar, but it's a very different very thing. Different. It's, it's it's back in the day of going back to the. I mean, I am a RSS reader, or RSS fan for years. I mean, I've been using it. I don't even know over a decade, much longer than that. As soon as I saw the RSS feed as a as a concept, it was just fantastic. And to see that Vivaldi is looking into making that sort of thing is something that is you know you're there, there's other browsers that had these features and ripped them out, and for no apparent reason they just ripped them out. And having something that is it's a, a full blown reader, not just like kind of a casual reader, like some of the browsers, right. is yeah. so nice. Because there's a lot of times where you know I'm trying to teach people how to use RSS readers, and the one I use is pretty complicated, and it's not something I would suggest. And I wanted to kind of introduce people in an easier way, and there's not really that many options for that. And I think it's really cool that Vivaldi is providing such an option. Thank yeah. you. So our community is made up, as you know, of open source advocates, including ourselves, of course. And so naturally, we have to dive into Vivaldi's source code. I assume, Manjaro and others, this question is going to come up time and time and time again uh, with the decisions that were made. On your site, you break it down, the code, the source code in this way. 92% of the browser code is open source coming from Chromium. So that's Chromium's part. We talked about already being open source. 3% is open source coming from Vivaldi itself. And 5% is your UI, which is closed source. Is there a future where Vivaldi is going to explore going 100% open source? Now, we talked about the fact you've made Linux a first-class citizen, the importance of privacy and security. Uh, we're so thankful for that piece of it. All of us in the community are. But that last bit, that last 5% that's closed source, is there a future where we can help convince you to take that step? I think, I mean, it's, it's a discussion that we are having internally, right? And, 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 because it, it, and it's really a question of comfortability with making the decision to go there and, and in what way we would do that. Now, an important thing, every piece of our code is actually readable. So the C++, you can just download, right? Now, the HTML part, which the, is the UI, I mean, the reality is we kind of encourage people to go and mod it, and they do. So you'll find actually threads on our site uh, where people are modding our UI, and we think that's fine. And we are trying to provide ways for them to do it. So the only thing that's really missing there is a license on, on, on that. And, and we've had discussions, and we are a little bit 
kind of uneasy, can we do that as a small company? Because we've kind of seen it can go really bad. Now, a lot of people will say, hey, it's Firefox true. is open source. It really went really well for them, except it was Netscape that open sourced. That's an interesting point. And it's kind of similar with KHML, which became WebKit, which yeah. became Chromium. And I don't even know that people know it was KHML. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah. so <laughs> that's the problem with for us. Uh, how can we do this and, and, and not risk our future? Uh, because there's companies with a lot more funding than us. I mean, we are a small company compared to the guys we're competing with. Even Mozilla is 100 times our size in the revenues, mm -hmm. just to be clear. So wow. when some people are saying that we are uh, we are a threat to Mozilla, um, maybe in a few years, but that's not really our target, right? I mean, we actually want, I mean, you heard what I said. I would actually like Mozilla to continue to thrive. I like these people. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we also want to thrive as a company. We're trying our best to provide the best possible software for people. And that's what we are about, right? Uh, and so the, the UI closed source portion of the code, in, in your mind, that's kind of your secret formula that if you could let that out, then somebody, Opera, anybody else could go grab those UI elements because it's very uniquely Vivaldi, take that, put it in their code. And since you're a small company, potentially, or a Firefox did this or whatever, they could stamp you out pretty quickly having your kind of last piece of code. Is that really the fear? I, I guess there's something, and, and, and you, some people will say we are irrational and, and, and the like. <laughs> uh, and and I, I mean, I can understand that. I guess in some ways we've seen what happened with the companies that went in this direction, that it isn't necessarily the companies that went open source that, that were the success. But it's nice that the code is there. And I mean, yeah. you can you can ask the question: What would have happened if Presto was open source? Maybe Opera wouldn't exist, but maybe Presto would be the default browser uh, in the world. Uh, it's quite possible, to be frank. And uh, it's fair to say the the opposite is true, though. You look at something like OBS. There were so many. I mean, Nvidia's own streaming service came in, right? Uh, Microsoft tried to launch their own streaming service. There was a tool that paid millions of dollars to get every Twitch person around to use. And OBS has been open source this whole time and it continued to dominate. So, but I get it. I understand it. And what I want to, what I want to mention is that we're happy that Linux is a first class citizen. We're happy that you brought Linux to us. And that alone is a huge step that a lot of companies won't take. So we're very, we'll be watching very closely to see that last 5% or see if there's a way that, um, you know, a future where it's a hundred percent open source. But you said something very interesting. I just want to dive into a little bit. You said that actually everything but the HTML portion is actually open source and people can go play in there. So does that mean any of the, like we talked about every 24 hours, kind of little pings uh, going to Vivaldi, all of that stuff can be audited in the code right now? Everyone, can uh, People can have at a look it. at all pieces of the code in reality. Because basically, there's C++ code, that's a repository, you can go and fetch that, right? And then you can look at the UI side of the code, which is HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and the like. And I mean, it, it, I'll grant it, say, it is minimized. But people with a little bit of kind of, they, they tweak it a little bit and they can see anything. People are also just checking kind of the connections and, and they're like, all of this, you can have a look at it. This isn't a question of uh, being able to read the code. You can actually read every piece of the code. It's all there. Either a C++, which you can look at the repository, or you can look at the HTML, JavaScript, and the CSS. And, and, and again, plenty of people do. Plenty of people go in there and they make changes. It's all there. Very nice. Yeah, that is very interesting. And uh, what are for people who want to make some changes or want to give you some suggestions or feedback and stuff on Vivaldi and the services that you offer, what is the best place for them to get involved with the project? I mean, in the community. And by the way, in, in some ways, I feel that Vivaldi is the perfect open source company in a very many ways because we have people that are volunteering to help us, right? 
So we have people that are helping us that have access to early versions of, of things where we don't necessarily put it all out there in the beginning, but they are there to help us test it and give us feedback. We put out snapshots all the time. And people are really engaging in the community, giving us feedback, what they like and what they don't like. And we take, we, we read that. We, and we try to tweak the, the, the product on the way uh, out. We have people helping us translate. Uh, Vivaldi. We have hundreds of people are helping us translate because we want to adapt to the needs of every user and that requires even, uh, I mean, we are adding languages that no one else is supporting, uh, which we are proud of. And this is, again, adapting to the needs of users. So we have a lot of people that we engage with. This is going back to why we are doing Vivaldi. It's for the community. This is, we felt that when Opera went in a different direction, they were being left out there, all those people that had helped us uh, kind of build Opera. And we felt we owed them to come back and give them a browser with the same kind of philosophy, just cleaner, because no investors mm -hmm. are going to tell us how to do things. We'll just listen to our users, build the best possible product, and continue doing just that. Very nice. I, I agree that all Wonderful. your philosophies, everything you're saying is, is an open source, 100% open source community like mentality. Um, and, and I just want to go back on one thing. You said a license was one thing that you guys were stuck on on that 5%. Is that, is that really the discussions you're having internal is just that licensing piece? And then it was part of our discussion. Do, do, did we Amazing. feel that we could put it out in a license that would be okay and that people would be happy with? So we were happy. So could we put out a license that people would be happy with that would kind of allow people to tinker with it, but not necessarily allow someone to run with it straight away? Yeah. So th that's what we were discussing. And Very nice. we've been we've been wanting to do something because. I mean, we like the community and we'd like to be accepted by the community as well because this is a community. It's kind of like, you know, we feel we are part of this community. We feel there's all this kindred spirit and then some people are kind of, don't they're mean to us right and and we would like to we would like to win them over because we want them to be our friends it's a very interesting problem that we have because very there's so many companies that have done people wrong you know how, how you mentioned there were companies out there that have done open source and it failed and that kind of gives you some caution um there there are so many companies who've come into open source and said oh yeah microsoft loves open source and we know the true intentions behind it but here with vivaldi and I think some people get stuck in that mode that any company is going to kind of go that wrong direction. With Vivaldi, a lot, we are kindred spirits in so many ways with a lot of things that, that you're saying and doing. And we're happy, I think, in that middle ground, Michael. We've talked about this a lot, that we, first we want to get companies to build something for Linux, right? Yeah. Get your software on Linux. Yep. Vivaldi did that. Then we want the company to be open about privacy and security, Vivaldi did that. Mm -hmm. Then the next step is we would love to convince them that open source is actually a protection and that in doing so, the community can come around and, and, and help make this project thrive like it should. And Vivaldi's getting close to that is what I'm hearing. And from that aspect, I'm, I'm really excited about the project. Absolutely. And, and I think people should mm -hmm. be patient that these are big decisions, that you made a big investment, you took a huge personal risk, and in fact, being a small company, decided to use those resources, which bigger companies like Mozilla, think about the VPN that took us two and a half months to get, don't make us a first-class citizen. Take six months. You're making us a first-class citizen. I appreciate those things. So I think as a community, we have to, we have to recognize and appreciate mm -hmm. the things you are doing. And yes, we want you to take that next step and get that license and be 100%. But we can be patient too. We'll wait for it. The path that I want companies to take to get to the open source thing, I understand it's a hard, it's a hard path to take because there are there there are pros and cons to everything, and there's pros and cons to open source. And I think that 
you know, ha- you're already on that path, and I'm I'm very excited to see you know what can come from that, and I'm also excited to see what can come from you know the partnership you have with Manjaro and see how that grows oh, yeah. in the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Jan, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate that Vivaldi has always treated Linux community as a first class citizen, and like I said, we're looking forward to see how the partnership grows with Manjaro as well as the future of Vivaldi itself. Thanks again for being on Destination Linux. Thank you. This episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. Bitwarden is an awesome piece of software. It is a password manager that allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are safe. How does it do that? Well, Bitwarden provides you with different kinds of tools. Like, for example, you want to store your passwords? Well, you get a secured vault from Bitwarden. If you want to be able to create new passwords and not have to worry about how complicated they are, well, you can use the automatic generator for those passwords. And then you can also fill in those passwords automatically in login forms so you don't have to do any of this stuff. And a lot of people don't know that if you don't have a different password for every website, you should because that you're basically the best friend of a hacker if you use reuse passwords. So don't do that. Get Bitwarden and get peace of mind. You can also get access on many different types of devices. You get like web browser extensions, you get mobile apps, desktop applications, and even on the command line if you want to use it. And Bitwarden also seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end encryption, and they do it on your local devices, so it doesn't ever leave your devices without being encrypted, which means that you're the only person with access to that data, and that is super important, because if I'm going to use any kind of thing that is going to have this kind of important details, I want to have it on Bitwarden because of that feature of the local encryption. And so go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And did I mention you get started for free? Well, you can, but I also want you to check out their premium accounts because they have a lot of great stuff in there. They got one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator for temporary one-time passwords, priority customer service, and so much more, including a new service called Bitwarden Send, where you can easily send files back and forth to people. It's just a great piece of software, and it starts at less than a dollar per month. That's right, less than one dollar per month, you can get access to all of these great features on Bitwarden. And also, I want you to check out their business accounts. If you have a business or you work in a business and you want to be able to roll this out and be able to share passwords back and forth in an organizational fault, because you don't really want to share password access to your stuff, that could be an issue. But with Bitwarden, you get a vault specifically for this purpose and it allows you to easily and quickly get set up with many people that you can actually safely and securely share your passwords and your data. And you can also do that with your family account if you wanted to do that. You can help people in your family who are not familiar with passwords get started with password managers. And it just it's such a great service. So check it out, bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring Destination Linux. After the news we covered last week regarding Australia's new surveillance laws, it was quite timely that we also got the release of two very privacy-focused distros out there, Tails and Hunix. First, we'll discuss Tails, which released 4.22 and includes a focus on solving the most important issues in the Tor Connection Assistant to make it more robust and easier to use. Some of the features that came out in Tails is simplifying the customer bridge interface to allow uh, only allow entering of one bridge, saving customer bridges to the persistent storage option that you can do within Tails. A lot of people don't know that it has that persistent storage mm-hmm. option in there, but it does and makes it awesome. Manual clock adjustment and reducing the timeout from 30 seconds to 10. In addition, and I'm very thankful for this, they added firmware for newer AMD cards so I can run it on my newer machines. They updated the Tor (laughs) browser version and Thunderbird. Uh, It's very important people know that these two distros kind of serve, they're they're very both security and privacy focused, but they serve very different purposes. There's a reason why they're kind of separate from each other. Tails is something that I keep personally on a USB drive wherever I go because it is a portable privacy distro. It does have that persistent storage option, which obviously if you're putting persistent storage on, it does reduce some of the security and privacy of that because you're saving things on a drive because otherwise it's amnesia. It forgets everything every time you boot that drive up. Tails is one of the reasons along with Hunix that I'm in Linux to begin with because it was one of the privacy and security distros that people recommended to me, what, four years ago on my channel when I was doing this type of stuff. So I'm so thankful 
for these incredible projects out there. I love supporting them and I don't go anywhere without my Tails USB drive. <laughs> Same here, Ryan. Mine's always in my wallet, in my purse. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it has been for years since it started. It is, it is the go-to mobile distro for privacy. Definitely. Yeah. And sometimes I go to places that have public computers. I'm not going to say which because I don't think it's necessarily right. <laughs> but I'll go to those places and I need to get into do something in a browser and I'll reboot those computers that are in the lobby with the USB in and it'll allow me to boot to my tails. And I have a secure system that's yes. not mine, but boots into my own OS of tails. It's it's very handy on the road. Let's put it that yes. way. <laughs> And what's really cool with the this version of Tails is is now the Tor connection will fail quick, quicker when it's impossible to connect to Tor. That's kind of been an issue because it would sit there yeah. and hang and hang and hang. And uh, this is especially especially great for if you're on a slower connection. Yeah, so and cut it down from like out much six minutes. It was like no, it was like five yeah. minutes to two minutes. It was like yeah, much yeah. better. Because <laughs> waiting for five minutes to get a connection that's not going to work will just be infuriating. So uh, yeah. that's really good. And also the manual clock adjustment that Ryan mentioned, it seems like it's not a big deal. That's a that's a thing that it makes it easier for people in different parts of the world to be able to connect to their system. Because if they weren't, weren't able to ch change that, it wouldn't connect to Tor properly sometimes. So that's, that's why that's a thing. Uh, but there's, I mean, Tails is one of those distributions that is just like it's one of those like it's an esoteric pr distribution kind of but it's also a mainstream or becoming a mainstream for the people who are uh, privacy and security i couldn't focused. imagine a world without it yeah, yeah. and it's, yeah. it's really cool but you said that there is a very big difference or a, a big difference between hunix and uh, tails what is the difference between that hunix is a general anonymous, the general purpose anonymous distribution in my mind. So you could go and install this, for instance, on your main machine and use it as a mm. daily driver. Tails, that would be a little difficult to do with its amnesia right. and, of course, persistent storage on a drive and things. Right. I'm sure people do do it, but that's really not its intention. Whereas Hunix, general purpose, you could utilize it every single day if you wanted to, but definitely focused heavily on that privacy and security Right, that's 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 really good point to make. Uh, also, uh, Unix uses uh, virtualization in addition to Tor, whereas uh, Tails is not really focused on the virtualization part. And it's really interesting because uh, Unix has uh, two parts essentially. There's the Unix gateway, which acts as a network gateway for anonymous communications, and there's also the workstation version, which is the desktop. And Unix 16 is the latest release of Unix, and I think it's about it's been in development for about two years or so. And this is a update from Debian 10 to Debian 11. Also, they updated some packages in terms of like which repos they use because they were using a, a Tor-based uh, packaging uh, repo, and now they're using the Debian.org repos. Mm -hmm. They've also updated some things about like VirtualBox and that kind of thing. So there's the thing about Hunix is really cool because it's a, a distribution that allows you to kind of have what Tails does but also have the benefit of, you know, you don't have to create a persistent storage and change the way that the system works and be able to use the benefits of it. So if you do want to have a daily driver option of a anonymous or anonymous connection uh, viable distribution, Hunix is a really cool option for that. But of course, either one of them are great options for people who are interested yeah, in privacy. Yeah, they both provide anonymity and security by default. They leverage the Tor network. There's so much to love about checking these things out. If you have an older machine that you want to do your banking on, a lot of people, I think Noah even recommends this, right? You go get a very inexpensive machine. It could be a used laptop, something like that. And that machine, its sole purpose is to do all of your banking and things on. You separate it from the rest of your computers or anything else that you do. What a great distribution to put on there, a Hunix or even Tails, for instance, depending on how many files and things you're going to want to save in persistent storage for that laptop. But both of these are going to provide you a lot of more security. There's no such thing as 100% security and privacy. Yeah. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. They're just going to provide you a lot more safety. Yep. Who Nicks or what? I, every time I see Who Nicks, I think of Dr. Who Nicks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nice I, reference there. Oh, yeah. I want them to make a make a new icon for the mascot. It's just like the the, the, the police, uh, the TARDIS yeah, thing. Yeah, the blue box. Yeah, the blue box. That'd be great. Michael, in, in, in post-editing, can we have a TARDIS go across the screen right there? Uh, you're making me do edits, and yes, yes, we will. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. 
Up next in the show, we're going to talk about the software spotlight and, well, creating presentation slides can be a tedious task, and you don't need the software that you're using to make them worse. So this week's software spotlight is going to spice up your presentations. And in fact, that's the name of the application, Spice Up. It's, <laughs> it's, it's basically a, it's a really cool way of being able to make presentations with a simple, easy to use interface. It doesn't have every feature under the sun like some places it seems to try to do, but what it does have is a great set of features with a very polished experience, which makes creating professional presentations a breeze. I mean, you can start off using one of the nice pre-built templates with beautiful background patterns and that sort of stuff and make some changes here and there if you want to, or you can start from scratch if you want to do that too. And you can insert images, shapes, and text boxes for all of your data and that sort of thing. And there's a bunch of other features like being able to export for PDF, there's a presentation browser that you can scroll through the presentations that you've made and you can jump right to them for one click. You can also, when you when you start a presentation, you can you have a pop-up separate window that gives you really easy access for notes about keeping track of what you want to say on it and also being able to easily quick uh, quickly jump to different slides. And you can have like different transition animations between different slides. So maybe you want to fade on one or you want to slide it for another, like another slide like actually use a slide on that slide, you could do that sort of thing. And, and that's really cool. And especially it has extra features like the web viewer version where you can be able to use it where you're not even, you don't even have to have Spice Up installed to use the presentation. So there's a lot of cool stuff in this particular application. And when uh, Ryan was telling me about this, I thought about like, is it that important to have something like this? So I tried it I'm like, wow. This is so easy to make a presentation, and I and I've used many. Next different time types. you go to Self yeah. Southeast Linux yes. Fest and you have to do a presentation, you oh know you're going to use. I am up. going to use this. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, okay. Speaking of which, I was at Self multi, a couple of years, and I've done presentations in different ways, and I use different software to do those presentations. None of them were easy to set up. None of them were easy to run. Some of them were weird, clunky things that I, I set up, and I did this, and I made a presentation in I think two minutes and it was all it looked nice it was all ready to go and it's like okay this is impressive so it made me go well i'm gonna start suggesting this to people because i have some one some person in, uh, that i know that has uses makes presentations all the time so it was just kind of like this is a no-brainer they would love this because it just makes it so easy well yeah nice. lots of people can make presentations in lots of different mm -hmm. software but this is an example of a piece of software that does one thing does it really well and what i like about it is some people have the eye for developing like Michael gradients and color usage and matching all that stuff to make <laughs> sure it looks. Then there's people like me who also have to do executive presentations and things every week, but has no eye for color, no eye for design. And what I like about this tool is that they do all of that for me. They make beautiful <laughs> gradients I can use and templates nice. that I can use and still make my presentation look good because I'm focused on the message. I don't care what I don't, I, my brain doesn't work in figuring out all of the designs and layout stuff. And it kind of does a lot of that for me. And I think that's what makes Spice Up so special. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the best standalone applications for presentations on Linux, bar none. Yeah. And it, it's nice to move away from the LibreOffice and the OpenOffice presentation systems. Just yeah, absolutely. Just to have more focus. Yeah. Those, yeah. Are, those are nice to have if you want more control for whatever reason. Yeah. But this one... I I prefer this for sure. Like it, it, I I do have a, a an eye for design, and I do. I'm actually a designer. For those who don't know, I'm a graphic designer, and I also do marketing and stuff like that. That's focused on vi visual elements. And when he showed this to me, I was like, "Really? Do we need to?" And then I, when I tried it, I was like, "Oh, I'm going to use this now." Like that's like it look. It's that good looking. Like it is very well done. And also like you talk about the gradients. To change the gradients, you just click two buttons and you're done. And there's like a slider you can change the Too angle. Too easy. Should be right. illegal. Nice. It's so good. Yeah. And it comes as a flat pack, so anybody can use it if you have flat pack installed. So there you go. <laughs> so Ryan doesn't have to get lost in the color wheel. <laughs> exactly, because you know I will. I want everything to be green. Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> So this week's tip of the week is open SSH secure file copy. Recently, I was working on the Jitsi server. I had to make so many changes, all of these different configs. Every day, practically, Michael's like, turn this feature on, turn this feature off, turn this feature on, turn this feature. After this show, every week, <laughs> our patrons hang out in a Jitsi room 
and we talk to them about all the things going on in the Linux world today, yeah. especially we're going to talk about this awesome interview that we had this week that was just amazing with Vivaldi, but we're also going to talk about the Matrix 4 trailer, all of that fun of stuff. <laughs> but we do that in the Jitsi room, and with all of these changes and files and things, I need a way that I can get all those config files quickly from that server because I'm using DigitalOcean, and I want to save those in case something happens or upload them on GitHub so other people could take advantage of them. And that's where SCP, Secure File Copy, lets you easily do that. You can move files back and forth, server to server, client to server, server to client, however you want to do it. Just some examples. This is going to be much better, of course, for you to go read the show notes or look this up on your own than me talking about it through a podcast. But you can run these commands like SCP, like if you had a file called test.txt, so you do scp space test.txt, your username, just like you're SSHing into the server, add in the IP address, a colon, a slash in the remote directory, and that's going to copy the file from the local host to the remote host, as an example. You can kind of reverse that a little bit and do your SCP, the username, at, and then from the IP address, colon, the file name, and then the directory locally that you have if you want to copy from a remote host to a local host. That probably doesn't make a lot of sense verbalizing it. Just go check out the command. It's very simple. It's SCP. It's going to make your life amazing if you want to save the files and all the configs and changes that you made from a client to a server or any of those combinations in between. So a huge thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. However you do it, we love your faces. And if you want more DL, you become a patron like all the beautiful people we have in our skybox. You can't see them, but they're piped in. They get direct access video audio feeds into the show. And then afterwards, we're going to go hang out with them in Jitsi and talk about Matrix 4 trailer. Of course. Yeah, of course. All that other he stuff. really wants to Linux-y. talk about Matrix 4. I apparently. really do. It's such a good trailer out there. But you get other perks like VIP access to events, live recordings of the show, and you could come hang out with the crew. Also, in addition, every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time or 1700 UTC, we are live on DaleNLive.com. And the best part about this is that everyone is invited to watch. The VIP access is just for patrons, but anyone can join us at DaleNLive.com to watch the recording of Destination Linux each and every week. And we can't wait to see you in the chat. And also, I think you want to check out DLNStore.com because there's a lot of great swag that you can pick up. We got t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, hats. Uh, t- uh, stickers, backpacks, aprons, like everything you can imagine. Not everything you can imagine, but most things you can imagine are in there in the dealinstore.com. Twill while you grill aprons? We can twill, <laughs> you can twill while you grill, yes. There's also a uh, a new thing where we're starting to add like tank tops for some people who are, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm getting into the old workout mode and having really thick black shirts. Don't you ever shirts. wear a tank top. I, Michael, really no. thick, really thick no. black shirts are not great no. for workout. So show you know, buff arms. <laughs> don't, you, don't you dare subject us to that, Michael. Uh, we'll no see. tank top for you. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, Dealinstore.com right. is where you can get something like that if you want to. And make sure to check out the amazing shows here on our wonderful Destination Linux Network. We have the Pseudo Show, the Ask Noah Show, This Week in Linux, the DOS Geek Channel, Deal and Extend, Hardware Addicts, GameSphere, and get your Fedora hat on with our latest show, the Fedora Podcast. So make sure to go to DestinationLinux.network and subscribe to all these wonderful shows to keep those penguins marching and the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. And and we should mention that speaking of the Fedora podcast, thanks to Grayson from the Fedora podcast for helping us out this week to pipe in all the audio from Jitsi. This shows you how awesome and knowledgeable Grayson is out there. So make sure to go check out the Fedora podcast. Yes. Everybody have a great week. And remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. Or if you take the red or blue pill. Oh, Jill. (laughs) Ah, I like it. You're speaking my language. Yeah. See you next week, everyone. (laughs) Okay, bye-bye.